Good afternoon. Today I'm talking to Owen Mullin. Thankfully, no technical issues today. Good afternoon, Owen. Would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit more about yourself and your books. Hi, thanks, Donna. Hi, I'm Owen Mullin. Um, I'm a crime writer from Scotland. Um, I'm speaking to you tonight from Crete. And I was just telling Donna before we came on live that we had a beautiful day here. It's blue skies and sunshine while everyone back in the UK is freezing with more to come. So I'm kind of glad I'm here. Uh, we've been here on and off because we split our time between here and Scotland, but we've been here for quite a long time and all my books have been written in this house actually. Um, when I come down here, this is how I got started. When I come down here, we decided we wanted to live in the sun as much as we could. Uh, and we wanted to reinvent ourselves. We're both very busy people up in Glasgow. Um, we wanted to reinvent ourselves. So, but we didn't have any idea beyond that. Um, and one day, uh, one day I, I, I had an idea for a short story and I wrote a short story. And um, when, I, when I was 10 years old, I won a short, a short story writing competition for primary schools. Um, and I didn't think any more about it for decades. Um, so when we got here one day, uh, one January actually, I started, I had an idea for a short story um, about Colonel Tom Parker, Elvis Presley's manager. Um, it's a kind of kind of gothic, kind of ghostly kind of thing, not, not really me at all. Um, and I wrote it and it was quite long, it was 20,000 words. And when I finally read it, it was terrible. Absolutely bloody awful. So, uh, but I saw there was something there. Um, see, I knew nothing at all about writing, nothing. Um, I, I was dis distressed to find out how little I knew about the English language, actually. Um, so I was really starting from the ground up and I decided I wanted to be good whatever good meant. And I used to have a piece of paper at the side of my PC with all my do's and don'ts on it. Don't do this, don't, don't say suddenly. You know, you in books they've got suddenly. Suddenly he walked across the room and made a cup of tea. No, you kind of don't suddenly make a cup of tea. I, I, overusing, I had this big list to try to, try to help me write better. So I kept on going at that. Um, I then went on and wrote a screenplay, uh, and there's quite a funny story. After the sh after I'd written the short story, we, uh, my wife Christine um, phoned up an agent, a literary agent in London. I can't remember which one. Of course, we didn't get to speak to the agent. We got to speak to the receptionist to get on the on the desk, and she was very nice. She spoke to us, and she said to Christine, oh, "What this 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 story?" What, what stage is it, is it at? And she said, oh, it's finished. He's just padding it out. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm going, no, no, I'm developing it, <laughs> developing it. <laughs> so, so that showed you. I also had this idea that we would just phone up Steven Spielberg and tell him a few ideas and he'd send us some money. Didn't work out that way. I wonder why. <laughs> I then went on to add a, add a dabble at screen, uh, screenplay writing just to see what it was about. And I spent a couple of months doing that. And then one day I woke up and I said to my wife, I think I'll write a book. And I'd had an idea. I uh, kind of woke up with the idea, the whole, almost the whole idea, very unusual. And I started writing that. And that, that, that book was called uh, The Road to Lahore. And then it was called Afra. And then it was called Over Years, because I'd rewrite it. And then it was called Song of the Blue Rock. And then it was called, finally, Nine Years Later. And this is, we were, before we come on, uh, you know, Donna, we were talking about writing. Uh, it took nine years to get that book published. Now, if someone had told me that, I wouldn't have bothered. <laughs> I wouldn't have bothered. But... Uh, so, but that was the beginning. Uh, th then I had all kinds of the, every writer will tell you the, the, the struggles, that they could paper the walls of the rejections. And that's, that's my story too. Um, 
But I kept writing, always kept writing, kept on going. So that when I eventually did get even my first break, I kind of had a lot of books. And I'm now just recently, uh, just last year, I've moved to a different publisher, Bolgood, who I can tell you honestly, are wonderful to wonderful wonderful to work with, having a great time with them. They've redesigned uh, all the books. They have all my back catalogue. They've redesigned all the covers. They look fab. I really like it. I have a wonderful working relationship with them. They have tremendous energy. But it's taken a long time to get to this point. And, you know, it's a bit like anything. We all want... One of the things we were discussing today is... Uh, we all want tomorrow's answers today. We all want tomorrow's outcomes today. Uh, and we can't get tomorrow's answers until tomorrow. We can't get what happens tomorrow, the outcomes, until tomorrow comes around. So that just leaves you with the day we have, this day. Yes. And what we all need to do is do our very best in these difficult conditions. And there'll be people out there watching as a whole uh, and some of them were, had pretty bad time with COVID and, and all the ramifications of it. Um, and I don't have a, a handy piece of advice for them because that would just be too trite. Yeah, but I would say it will pass. George Harrison had an album called All Things Must Pass. He was quite a spiritual guy, George. All Things Must Pass. This will pass too. And... What we, the challenge for all of us is to take care of ourselves and, our, and each other and stay safe and do the right things and wear the mask and wash our hands and keep distance so that when they finally do get the pandemic under control, we are still here to go back to help the world get back to where it used to be. Now, um, we're down here in Crete. Uh, and honestly, we live on the side of a mountain overlooking the bay and it's, it's all fabulous. Um, and we're very fortunate because we're out of harm's way. That isn't the case. I mean, we could be in the 13th floor of a flat with three screaming kids and a, a partner we don't love or don't go on with. That's not the case. So we're very fortunate. So that's where I am just now. I spend my time here in Crete. On the way, the two of us came here. On the way, my wife, Christine, had never edited or been interested in anything technical with books ever. And just by throwing some ideas in, in with me, it grew and grew and grew until, you know, now she is a kind of a full collaborator on all the things. We work on the plots together. She edits as we go. Uh, she does all the marketing. If you've seen any any own Mullen marketing, some of, it's, some of it's pretty impressive. Um, and she's, she's putting all that together um, with no background knowledge, no great equipment. Um, I became a writer, she became all these things. And that wasn't how we landed here. We didn't land it with none of these things. So back to, we don't know where the road goes. We don't know how the story is going to unfold for us. I would waste it if we did. If finding out is all part of the fun. Now this is the theory. And I'm very spiritual when I'm talking theoretically. <laughs> but <laughs> unfortunately, Unfortunately for me, uh, one of my character defects is I can be a bit impatient. I want everything now. I don't want to wait for anything. Uh, but I've, I've learned, I'm learning. And of course, being here, a slower pace of life and writing books, I mean, writing a book is a major undertaking. It's um, months of your life. That you, I mean, I come down every morning, I have my breakfast, I check the news and I go over and I start writing and that's me most of the day. And um, I can't remember the guy, Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut, who wrote, famous American writer who wrote Slaughterhouse-Five. Um, he said, um, talent, a great quote, he said, talent is relatively um, common. Living the life of the writer is much more difficult. And I found out that's true. So that's me. That's who I am. That's where I am. Um, did you always want to write and do you wish you'd started sooner? That's a good question. I didn't always want to write. Um, and I used to think I wished I'd started sooner, but the truth is I actually was busy and happy doing other things. 
and the and the guy who opened the PC and started to write that short story or the or out of the silence, he wasn't around thirty years ago, twenty five. He that's not who I was. So it's it's back to wanting to be who, who I am today. Back then, it's not possible. So it would have been helpful to me uh, in some ways to have started earlier. But you can only do what you do and be where you are. You know, it's, it's, you can only be the person you are at the time. I don't think I was actually ready to write 25 years ago. I don't think, there's a, there's a story about the ancient Egyptians. The ancient Egyptians apparently had brains that had the same capacity as our brain. They weren't backward in any way. I mean, they, they built those pyramids, for example. So the question would be, why did they not invent the motor car? Why did they not invent the combustion engine? Uh, and the answer to that is because they had all the brain power. The answer to that is the same as why I didn't start writing. They didn't think about it. It didn't occur to them. And it didn't occur to me to come, even when I, the week before I came down here, I was in a recording studio in London, and an old friend says to me, are you going to write when you go to, down to Crete? And I said to him, write what? That's how much of an idea I had. So you can't tell where the road goes, you know? Um, what drew you to the genre that you write in? Sorry, what's... What drew you to the genre that you write in? What drew me to it? I think I write what I would read. I think that's a, a common answer to that, and it's my answer too. Um, when I read, I tend to read people like John Connolly or uh, James Lee Burke down in New Orleans, um, read people like that. Um, so I'm attracted to crime fiction um, as rather than historical romance or, or whatever. Um, so when I come to write, and most of the television that we watch will be dramatic stuff and it'll be often crime-based stuff. I'm not all that keen on police procedural things. Um, that's why I, um, my major characters are not detectives. Not yet, that may change. So I kind of, kind of write what I would like to read. And I, when I'm writing a book, I'm also trying to write a book that I would want to read. Um, that's, one, that's one of the things I have in my head, you know? And maybe that's the same for everyone. I think so, yes. Yeah, it's a common answer, so. Um, you set your books in the UK, don't you, generally? You're not set any in Crete yet? <laughs> Haven't set any in Crete because that just hasn't called to me. Um, the first book I wrote was in Pakistan, Out of the Silence, a long time ago now. Um, and we were there and we've been to, we've been there and we've been to that area, uh, the, the region, as they call it. I mean, we've been to India about three times and up into Nepal and all that. And, and we took a, a side trip to, to Pakistan. Um, so I had an idea how the place felt. And then I had the story, I woke up with the story. So that's how that came to be. Um, and if that book had been picked up and had been a success early on, um, I, I think my crime writing would have taken a different turn because I have another book that's set in Morocco that I, I've never pursued the whole thing because I got onto something else. The reason I started writing a Charlie Cameron in Glasgow because the, the literary agent that I had at the time, uh, woman in Regent's Park, has said to me, oh, and you must write something Scottish. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be easier to sell you if you wrote something Scottish. So... Um, we were down at Loch Lomond. Uh, we were on, on a holiday back to Scotland. We were down at Loch Lomond. It was a beautiful day, and there were kids diving off a pier into the loch, which is freezing, by the way. And there was an old guy painting his fence blue. Uh, and Christine said, you could write here, you could write a detective. It doesn't need to be the usual alcoholic down at heel at odds with authority maverick. He can be a guy who's doing all right. And from that, Charlie Cameron three books, actually four books. We've just finished the fourth channel coming because Bullwood asked me to write another one as well as the Glass Family thing, So, which we've done. We just finished that three days ago. Uh, and you see, I'm saying to you, finished that three days ago, <gasps> big breath, about to start something else. <laughs> um, 
Uh, what's been your favorite moment as an author so far? That's a really easy question to answer. I've been very fortunate. A lot of nice things happened to me. The letter I got from my commissioning editor the other day was, was beautiful, was wonderful. So, so complimentary. Um, Games People Play was long listed for Crime Book of the Year at Bloody Scotland in 2017. And what they do is they, they, uh, they take a photograph of all the long listed people, 12 of us, and there I was with Helen Fields and uh, Ian Rankins on this shoulder and Christopher Brookmeyers on this shoulder. In front of me is Val McDermott and Denise Miner, I'm leaning on her shoulder, and me. Um, now that was very nice to think, wow, all of a sudden I've gone right into this big time. That was really great, but it wasn't the nicest thing. The nicest thing, the most fun thing was my grandson, Devin, at that time would be a bit, what, what, what would he be? He'd be seven or eight. And there was a copy of the book in his parents' house. And he sneaked it into his school bag and took it to school to show the teacher that his granddad was a writer. Uh, that, that, when I heard that, honestly, I thought, oh, my. And the teacher was cool. She got him to uh, stand up in front of assembly and tell, tell the whole school about his granddad who'd written this book. Um, that was, it. That was the, the nicest thing by far, that by far. Yeah, oh, that's lovely. <laughs> um, what's the most interesting thing you found researching your books? Well, when you're doing research, you find loads and loads and loads of things. And um, as a writer, you have to be careful with research. Knowing too much about something and putting it in a book, back to what we were talking about before when we were talking off air about forensics, it can't detract from the story. Um, so you've got to be careful you don't have a big information dump in page 142. Um, because you know this stuff, you want to, and it would put the word count up, which would mean you were closer to the end. <laughs> but uh, so I, I avoid that. But I did find out one interesting thing when I was writing uh, what book? Deadly Harm. Deadly Harm. Um, and in one of the scenes in Deadly Harm, she goes to this hospital in Glasgow. So when I was when I was researching it, uh, I discovered that this hospital had started life not where it is now in Glasgow, but over in a, an area called Cowcaddens, um, and they, they had got a, a charter from uh, they they started work in 2010 and finished it in 2014, uh, and they called it the Glasgow Lunatic Asylum. But in the next 10 years, they got a charter from Buck from the King from Buckingham Palace. Uh, and they, they up upgraded their status. So they had plenty of time to think about the name and they changed the name. They changed it from the Glasgow Lunatic Asylum to the Glasgow Royal Lunatic Asylum. <laughs> so that was quite interesting to find out. <laughs> yeah, they took a long time thinking about that, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what imaginative people were those pre-Victorians must have been. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you hide any secret jokes or messages in your books that only a few people will understand? No, I don't, I don't think I, I don't think I do. I can't think of any off the top of my, my head. Uh, I do have a kind of recurring, actually when I think about it, it doesn't recur in the new Charlie Cameron because he doesn't get a chance to see it. But in the background to Charlie Cameron, the Charlie games people play and the other, other two, other three as it will be, um, his background, he's from a well-to-do family. They're the people who own Cameron's distillery. They, they're the whiskey people. So his family are rich and they've subsequently been taken over by the Japanese. As Charlie goes through Glasgow and goes through his cases, every book someone says to him, Cameron, you're not related to those whiskey people, are you? And in every book, he has the same answer. He says, wish I had their money. 
<laughs> so I put that I put that in all the time. In fact, I'm going back tomorrow to the book and I'm going to put that in somewhere. <laughs> Keep it going. Um, do you find it harder to name your characters or to name the books? I find the I find the names of the characters come very easily. I don't know why that is. Um, I try to avoid uh, silly names. Um, I try to, they need to sound like the, as if they would be real people to me. Um, I don't often know where the names come from. I do know where Charlie Cameron, speaking a lot about Charlie, although Charlie isn't the current book, my wife's maiden name is Cameron. And back to that agent saying, you must write something Scottish Owen. Well, we thought Cameron, you can't get much more Scottish than Cameron. It's a old Scots clan. So that that's how uh, that's how that came about. As for Danny Glass and Luke Glass and Nina Glass, they were called something else. And again, I just woke up and had this had this idea. I said, no, no, no. They're not called this. Their names, the, the family name is Glass. Now I don't know anyone whose family name is Glass. So God knows where these things come from. But what we do is we have a, a character list because it's confusing for people if you have two people in the book are both called Jim. So you've got to try and make sure that the characters are all, even at that small level, differentiated from each other. But no, naming characters isn't a problem. No, they just, it just comes to me. But the titles of your books, I guess that's harder. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. Well, funnily enough, in, in, in the new Charlie Cameron book, which will be out in October, there's a character who has the same name as, as another character in another book. And we thought for two minutes whether we should change that and we decided no. It, it, if it was in the same book, yes, but in a different book, no, in a different scene, in a different setting, a different story, no, that won't matter. That won't matter. So, and then there are, there are loads and loads of names out there. Just some names appeal to you more than others. God knows why, you know. Um, have you ever had any dreams or nightmares about your books or your characters? No, I've, I have never. I've, I've, I, I can do this. I can honestly tell you. I do my hours every day. And we'll have a chat about it. And then I'll watch television. And I'll leave it down. And I kind of want it to be that way because I do seek balance in life. I don't want it to be all books, 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 writing, writing, writing. Uh, I do, we're great travelers. Um, before we came here, you know, we been to the Amazon and been to Botswana and Japan and all kinds of stuff, you know. And I'm going to go back to that again soon. Uh, but uh, no, I, I don't have any problems with any of these things really. Um, the book, the book is work. The book is the day job, um, and it's like saying, "Do you keep thinking about your day job when you're home?" Well, sometimes, but but no, mostly no. You go on with the other aspects of your life. You know, that's the healthy thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, some people are obsessed. You know, some like Stephen King, for example, is just an obsessive writer. That's why he spent fifty odd years writing f sixty books or whatever it is. Um, which is an enormous, an enormous undertaking uh, uh, by itself. But I don't have that compulsive aspect to me. Um, one day I had a real drought and I spent seven hours and wrote 189 words. That was a very bad day. Um, most of the time I'm happy to do my, I give it the best I've got. I show up, I give it the best I've got, and then I move on to the rest of my life. Um, what's your biggest fear and would you ever write about it? Hard to say what my biggest fear is. I remember when you were talking to Conrad, he said heights. Um, I have <laughs> yeah, a thing about funny. snakes. I have a thing about snakes. Now, I'm fascinated by them, but I'm also terrified by them. I'm, I'm kind of drawn and fascinated and terrified. And down here, we have, we have snakes. Um, not very many, you see one occasionally. They're not they're the same kind of snakes you would have in Scotland or England, really, you know. They eat mice and things like that, and they're not really not really harmful to you. Nevertheless, they're snakes. 
And in one book, I won't tell you which book, but if you read it, you will know. In one book, there, there is a snake. In fact, there are two snakes. Um, so uh, I use that kind of fear in that, you know. I used it in that. Um, if you were to spend a day with an author, alive or dead, who, who would you spend a day with? Gosh. Well, I mean, I think I would spend the day with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, or I would probably spend the day with Raymond Chandler. Now, Raymond Chandler, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, of course, has invented, created the most famous fictional detective of all time, Sherlock Holmes. Um, but Raymond Chandler and before him, Dashiell Hammett. Mm -hmm. See, Donna, it's easy to assume that the world has always been the way it is. Uh, but it isn't. Crime fiction uh, in, this, in the forms that I write or other people write is still relatively new. Um, way back at the beginning of the 20th century, the, one of the very first guys to, to write that kind of thing was Dashiell Hammett. Mm -hmm. And he was, a, he was the influence of Raymond Chandler, who invented, created Philip Marlowe, and that kind of hard-boiled, one-line characters that uh, almost epitomizes what um, crime fiction detectives are all about in, in, uh, in the, the Glass family and in, in family. Uh, there isn't that kind of character, but, the, but those kind of pithy one-liners are still there, albeit they're a bit more darkly delivered. In the Charlie Cameron series, it's Charlie's sidekick, Pat Vogue, who has, um, who has a lot of the... A lot of the, the, the funny lines, the kind of memorable lines. Although I had one, for, I was reading a little bit the other night there that Charlie said he, he's had a drinking session and he doesn't really drink and he wakes up and he's feeling terrible. He has a shower and he says to the reader, the shower helped, now I felt good enough to make a will. <laughs> well, that, was the, that kind of influence comes from way back in the recesses of your my mind anyway, from people like uh, Raymond Chandler. Um, Arthur Conan Doyle was responsible for the uh, forensic investigation of pollen. He was really interested in uh, in plants and things. So he's actually the first person that looked at pollen at crime scenes. Is that right? Yep. Well, I know that he was also uh, one of the one of the first people to to take fingerprinting seriously. Um, but I don't know if you know this about Conan Doyle. He actually resented Sherlock Holmes because he, became, he felt himself he'd become saddled by Sherlock and uh, overshadowed everything else he did. Um, so, I mean, he actually killed him off when he goes over the Rickenback Falls fighting with Moriarty. Um, and, and there was a public outcry, so to kind of resurrect him. Uh, a bit like um, Bobby Ewing in, in Dallas all those years ago when he wasn't really dead. <laughs> yeah. It's all been a dream. Yes. <laughs> uh, what's your most embarrassing story? I can't, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will tell you one. I will tell you one. I'm quite well known for being the absent-minded professor, right? Uh -huh. I, I'm only interested in what I'm interested in, and I'm not interested in anything else much. And years ago, my wife said to me, let's go for a sunbed, right? I said, okay. So uh, at what, we went to this place, and it wasn't a sunbed. It was a tan stand, you know, where you're going to stand up. So, and, and my, my, Christine runs my whole life, I have to tell you. You know, she, she organizes everything in it. My name and my address are, are actually sewn into the back of my, my clothes. Uh, so, so if I get lost, I, I can find my way home. <laughs> so we go, we go to the stand, stand, and Christ, tan stand, and Christine said, no, look, here's your token. This is what you do. Go into the tan stand, close the door, put the, the coin in the, 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 the slot, and it'll all come on. And it'll come on for 20 minutes, and then it'll come off, you can back out. So I did that. I went in, uh, closed the door, put it in, it all comes on. And within about 30 seconds, I thought, this is terrible. 
this is too hot, this isn't safe. This is, I'm going to get skin cancer here. I'd opened the door and I stumbled out. And then I realised what was wrong. I hadn't taken my clothes off. <laughs> no wonder, yeah. No recommended. No. <laughs> I hope she uh, took the piss out of you for quite a while for that. Still does, but but I give her a con. I, I give her a constant um, stream of these things. So there's a, several a day, you know. you have to. Um, what's your biggest pet peeve? Well, I've got several actually. Um, Drivers, other people driving, uh, I'm, I'm not very good. I'm not very patient. Um, I, I seriously actually have to work on that because um, I swear and I bang the steering wheel and uh, um, I do I do all that kind of I do all that kind of thing. Um, I'm pretty I'm pretty bad on that. I have to say, I have to say. I think that's one of my worst my worst things worst things I do. Yeah, I have to agree with that, actually. And I think that's getting worse. I hate... I love driving, but, yeah, I hate other drivers. Mm, mm. Um, if you were to invite four famous people to a dinner party, who would you invite? Well, I think you were listening the last time I was asked this question, weren't you? Yep, so I'm going to see if it's... Well, actually, not that I necessarily remember what the answers were. <laughs> well, well, well... <laughs> I think it would be quite interesting to have a, a chin wag with Jesus Christ. I think that would be quite interesting. Um, he could maybe tell us a thing or two about those answers we want tomorrow that we kind of, uh, today for tomorrow. Um, Jesus Christ would be one. Conan Doyle might be one or Mark Twain. Uh, I mean, you could also, I think the last time I was asked this, I had a whole rogues gallery of terrible people like... Uh, uh, Fred and Rose West and and um, who else was it? Hitler Harold and Trump. Harold, Harold Shipman. Harold <laughs> Shipman. Uh, but I, 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 I cracked a joke to my sister a few years ago. My mum was very old. She died, but she was very old, and she but she was very alert, and she was a bit awkward one day. And I said to my sister, the two of us were with, and I said to her, so my mum could hear. I said, you know. What Dr. Harold Shipman did was a heinous crime. But some days I can see where he was coming from. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you poor bum. <laughs> Careful, bum. <laughs> um, if you were stranded on a desert island, what three things would you want with you? How many do I get? Three, just three, because I'm mean. I'll tell you a joke. I think I would need to have coffee. I think I'd need to have coffee. Chocolate would be nice. And, uh, and Indian food, a guitar. There's a lot of things. But I'll tell you a joke. Um, a leprechaun appears in front of an Irish man and it says, you can have two wishes, two wishes, anything you anything your heart desires. And the Irish guy says, give me a pint of Guinness, give me a bo big bottle of Guinness. So boom, it appears. So this is fantastic. She says, what do you want? And she said, she says, this bottle of Guinness is a magic bottle of Guinness. When you drink it, it automatically fills up again. Drink it, it automatically fills up again. He says, that's fantastic. She said, what would you like for your second wish? He says, give us another one of those Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're never happy, are we, <laughs> as a species? <laughs> Um, so what are you working on at the moment and what's coming next? Okay, well, 
finally, uh, that's when came my first foray into gang land, uh, is in the charts right now, it's doing great. I've just got the edit for the follow up to that insider back from, from my editor. Um, and there's another one planned, uh, which will be starting on in a few days. We've also just finished the fourth Charlie Cameron book. So basically, I'm going to be doing the edits on the second Glass family book and then starting the third one. Oh, insiders on pre-sale. I'm just getting nudged to mention that. <laughs> so get it, boy. <laughs> So we're really, we're really busy, Donna. It's, um, it's been a, tr and of course, all my other titles are coming out. My back, my entire back catalogue's coming out this year. My back list's coming out. There are four that are coming out in March the 23rd. And then I think in, I think in April, they're republishing Games People Play. I think uh, uh, Insider, the second glass book, is coming out in July. Uh, there are two other Charlie Cameron's coming out as well, and then in January we'll have the third glass book. So it's really, really, and all these things generate their own work in um, marketing and, and doing you know, conversations with people who are interested enough to speak to you. Thank goodness. So it's really, really busy. Um, we really need a holiday to tell you the truth. I mean, you may think, well, you're sitting in the sun all day, and you need a change of scene. It's, it's, you know, wherever you are, you need a change. You need to come out of what you're doing just now. Because, um, you know, when we live here, we live here. We don't sunbathe or any of that. That's what you do when you're on holiday. Um, we, we're not on holiday. Uh, so we work. So we're busy, busy, busy writing all the new stuff. Um, are you planning on going to any of the book festivals if any actually go ahead this year? Yeah, I would like to get to um, what is Scotland in September. Um, as I said to you, we're planning to come home in April, but that may not be possible. It would be good to get to Harrogate and it would be good to get to uh, what is Scotland. Um, we'll see how possible all that is. I, ho I hope, it, even if I don't be there, I hope that um, the, those festivals, those events go ahead because I, I certainly haven't been to Har Have you been to Harrogate? I'm dying to go. I really want to go. Yeah, I haven't been, but I've heard it's amazing. It is. It's really good. I, I really enjoyed my time there. Um, I did a, I did a, uh, an event with Peter May, who was very nice. I'm glad you're saying that. Actually, I'm interviewing him at the end of March, so uh, I, that should be interesting. <laughs> well, you know. As we, as we, he was, they were really there to see him and I was just kind of doing a reading. Um, but as we were going down the stairs to the stage, he says to me, I mean, of course, he's really famous and I'm not. He said, um, are you going to read? I said, yeah. He said, oof. I said, what, do you, do you not read? He <laughs> says, do you not like it? He says, I don't, don't mind doing it. It's just, I'm, I'm not very good at it. So I don't do it. So Peter May doesn't read extracts from his books. That's good. I'll remember not to ask him when I talk to him. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good interview you've got lined up there, eh? Yeah, it was, thanks to someone else, actually. Um, someone that I've become friendly with doing this. Contacted him because she knows him. And then, yeah, now um, his, his people contacted me and, and it's happening. Well, he's got, he'll, you'll probably ask him how he came to become well-known. And he's got a kind of similar story to the story I'm telling you. You know, the, the book that became really big for him had been turned down by every publisher in the UK. So you probably know all this, but uh, yeah, yeah, that'll be good to speak to him. Yeah, I'm uh, quite terrified, actually, <laughs> but it would be fine. He won't, he won't remember me. He won't remember me. We met for five minutes, you know. I'm going to ask him anyway. You never know, might do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, do you hear much from your readers? From my readers? Yeah. <laughs> All the time. All the time. Um, people come back to me and, and stay in touch with me and uh, really all the time. 
uh, and I'm really grateful to hear from them. Um, it's amazing. And people are so, one of the things that has happened to me, I have to tell you, since I started writing and I get into the world of books, the number of people, including yourself, and I don't, not just saying that, the number of people who've been very kind to me, have given me their time, have bought my books, have read them, have reviewed them, um, who've shared them, who've talked about them. People I don't know, people I didn't know before. Um, just really, really, really nice and hugely appreciated. Um, so someone said to me, you must get, get people contacting you all the time. You'll be too busy to reply to them. I said, no, no, no. I'm never too busy to reply to anybody. If I haven't replied to someone, it's because I've missed the, the post or, you know, some, I've, everyone, everyone gets a reply, of course, so they should too, you know. Yeah, I like that actually, um, being part of that community is amazing, even as a reader, yeah. I love it, it's great. Yeah. Um, well, I don't think I have any more questions for you, unless there's anything you haven't told us that you would like to. Well, I'd like to tell you about family, would I? Go for it. <laughs> well, my new book uh, is called Family. It's a gangland thriller set in South London and features uh, br brothers, brother, two brothers, Danny and Luke Glass, and their sister Nina. And it's a, it's, a, it's a roller coaster ride through gangland South London. And it's in the charts. It's, on, it's been on pre sale, did great. Now it's in the charts. Um, the other one to follow up is on sale as well. I'm looking forward to writing the third one, which will start in a few days. Um, and I'm really at home with the characters. I'm at home writing in London because London is one of my favourite places and I know it pretty well. Uh, and I've got the beginnings of the plot for the third one and it's, it's really looking good. It's been fun. You know, writing books can be quite a task, but this has been fun. So I hope that comes through in the writing. Yeah, it's on my TBR. <laughs> um, I've seen well, great well, feedback. Come back, and come back and tell me. Come back and tell me. Well, I will, don't worry. <laughs> I might read it. I'm up early with my dog tomorrow, so I might read it early in the morning, and then I'll let you know. But right, I've right. seen great feedback for it, and I love the cover as well. I think it's really cool, so I'm glad yeah, it's The cover is fantastic, isn't it? It is. Love it's that. brilliant, yeah. Love that cover. Love that <laughs> cover. All the, all the covers that uh, Bob would have done, I really like them, you know. Um, They've got a terrific identity look to them. We, 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 I used to run a design company, so I'm quite critical of that kind of thing. I'm, we're really, really blown away with it. Yeah, I like it. It, it really stands out as well. Yeah. Um, would you like to tell everyone where they can find out more about you and where they can get your books? Well, you can you can get me my books everywhere. Amazon, Kobo, Barnes & Noble, uh, all, all, any, anywhere they sell books, uh, you, you can get own own mulling books. Um, and I hope you, I hope you do. You're also, they also come in all, all the formats under the sun, uh, even hardback, paperback, ebook, Audible, large print, um, Spotify. Uh, so I'm, tr I'm taking over the world one page at a time. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> and where can they find you? Um, well, well I've, I've got my author page and my Facebook page. So if you want to come on there, anyone wants to come on there and talk to me or check me out, I'm there. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Listen, thank you very much. It's been great talking to you. You too. Lots of fun. <laughs> right. Now,